Hello and welcome to this event on the future of work and skills and the importance of place. I'm Emily Tanner, Programme Head for Post-14 Education and Skills at the Nuffield Foundation and I'll be guiding you through today's sessions, putting your questions to the panels and making sure that we capture all of today's spoken and written input. The rapid changes in the UK labour market prompted by technology and social and economic forces are important to understand both for economic policy and to ensure that people and communities can thrive in the places where they live. This is a significant area of investment for the Nuffield Foundation and today's event centres on three research programmes that explore the future of work and skills through different lenses. A common theme across the research is that while change brings opportunity, these opportunities are not evenly distributed and there is a risk that inequalities will widen unless we intervene. We will hear from our expert speakers how data and evidence can help to address this challenge. The event is an opportunity for sharing evidence, experience and ideas. We have about 450 people taking part, a great mix of local and national policymakers, employers and researchers. And we hope very much that it will give you food for thought in your own work. It is part of the Nuffield Foundation's 80th anniversary series in which we are spotlighting themes that we expect to be an important part of our future strategy. So a few words on how the session will run. We will begin shortly with three presentations from the research programmes. I will then pass to Tim Gardham, CEO of the Nuffield Foundation, to chair a panel discussion with the research leads and to respond to your questions. Following a short comfort break, our second panel of local, regional and business experts will be chaired by Professor Sir Keith Burnett, Chair of the Nuffield Foundation, and will focus on how this research and future research can be put to use in your localities, again followed by Q&A. We invite your participation in three ways. First, please post your questions to the panels in the Q&A area of Zoom. Any questions that we don't cover today, we will capture after the session. Second, please tell us what you think our future research priorities should be. You can do this on Slido using the link provided. We're keen to know your top priority for new evidence, the improvements and innovations in data infrastructure that you would like to see, and how local policy leads and researchers can work more effectively together on this agenda. Let us know who you are, if you're happy to do so. And thirdly, please share your thoughts and continue the conversation on social media using the hashtag place and opportunity. Before we start the recorded presentations, Professor Sir Keith Burnett would like to add a few words of welcome. Over to you, Keith. Thank you, Emily. Welcome to this webinar. I just wanted to spend a few moments properly welcoming you, but also to say just how important this work is to the foundation. Um, as Emily's told you, there are, you're going to hear about three major research programs that, that we fund, but they really are core to the thing that the foundation was set up by Lord Nuffield for in the first place. We're looking really to get advice, information, ideas about how we make the United Kingdom, in its broadest sense, a great place to work and live in. And you're going to hear about work of the research we funded, and I'm very grateful for the social scientists who've been involved in that research. Without it, we could not have these presentations. We could not have the good stuff that the United Kingdom needs. And then later on, as Emily said, I'll be chairing a group where we'll hear from regional leaders who will give their input to it and give their reflections on what we hear. So I personally welcome you, but also really looking forward to the discussion today. So I'm gonna hand back to Emily now. We'll carry on with today's proceedings. Great, thank you. So now we have the presentations from the three research programmes and we're going to hear first from Lindsay Judge from the Resolution Foundation who's going to tell us about the Economy 2030 inquiry that reported last month. My name is Lindsay Judge and I'm Research Director of the Resolution Foundation. The UK has huge strengths as an economy. Think about our world-class universities or cutting-edge industries such as pharmaceuticals. 
But for the last 15 years, the UK economy has been in relative decline. Our productivity has grown at only half the rate of other advanced economies, and average wages have flatlined as a result. That has cost the average worker over £10,000 this year in lost wages, compared to where they would stand if wages had grown at their previous rate. Add to that the fact that the UK is the most unequal large economy in Europe, and it's no surprise that low-income families in Britain are 27% worse off than their counterparts in France and Germany today. Over the last three years, the Resolution Foundation has been working with the Centre for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics on the Economy 2030 inquiry. Together, we've been exploring why the UK is a stagnation nation and developing a comprehensive agenda for change to boost growth and drive down inequality too. Our conclusion? Britain needs a new economic strategy that goes beyond nostalgia and wishful thinking, and instead is serious about the nature and scale of the challenge. Nowhere is that truer than when it comes to our second cities in the UK. Britain has manufacturing strengths, but is the second biggest services exporter in the world behind the United States. Places like Birmingham and Manchester should be hives of activity, full of highly skilled workers and cutting edge services firms, but they're not. Instead, both cities have below average productivity, low investment, and a graduate premium that is little different from their surrounding regions. Turning the fortunes of our second cities around is crucial, not just for their residents, but also for the nation. Successfully reducing the productivity gaps between London and Manchester and Birmingham, so they are similar with Paris, Lyon and Toulouse, would boost national output by 1% a year and transform the living standards of near 6 million people living in those areas. And that would raise median incomes by 2,400 a year across Greater Manchester and by 1,700 across Birmingham. So how can that be achieved? We know that highly productive firms generally choose to locate in places where there's a large pool of highly skilled workers. But in this respect, our second cities do not perform particularly well. Birmingham has the lowest share of graduate workers of any major UK city. And with a graduate share of just 39%, Manchester lags behind places like Bristol, like Glasgow and London on this measure too. We estimate that Birmingham and Manchester together need around 345,000 more graduate workers to provide the skills that high-paying, knowledge-intensive firms need. Realistically, only a small share of this can come from upskilling the existing adult population in those cities. Instead, the bulk of this much-needed highly skilled workforce will come from inward migration from other parts of the region and nation, alongside better retention of recent graduates. But that could be different in the future. If Manchester and Birmingham schools performed better, far more of this much needed talent could be homegrown. The leading role graduate workers will play in a higher productivity UK does not mean we should take our eye off the rest of the workforce. In a flourishing economy, well-paid sectors such as financial and business services should be employing almost three times as many people with below degree level qualifications than they are currently. So why aren't they? Well, because our education and training systems do not support workers to develop the right skills in the first place. For example, 30% of 18 year olds are not in education or training in the UK today, many more than in comparator countries. When it comes to higher education, the Robbins principle ensures that all qualified people who wish to progress to university are able to find a place. This principle is entirely absent for vocational training. Instead, the funding for further education over the age of 18 is capped, and that needs to change. An apprenticeship place should be available for every qualified candidate, and we need demand-led funding for all forms of further education. And there are other systemic problems in the labour market we need to address. Good work is the bedrock of a fair economy, and a key part of that agenda is the minimum wage. It's hard to overstate what a policy success the minimum wage has been. Introduced cautiously, ramped up recently, it has driven down rates of low pay over the last 20 years, especially to the benefit of young, female and or ethnic minority workers. But we need to go further and set the minimum wage on an even more ambitious trajectory with a 73% of average earnings endpoint kept in mind. 
And alongside low pay, we also have to tackle poor conditions in the workplace. Over the last two decades, lower earners' job satisfaction levels have fallen even as the minimum wage has risen. Work, for many, is increasingly characterised by precarity. There are 1.2 million zero-hours contract workers in the UK today. Half of shift workers get less than a week's notice of changes to their hours. And in the absence of a decent sick pay system, many low-paid workers have to live on £44 a week when they are too ill to work. We need better national rules and regulations to ensure that those on the lowest earnings enjoy the same rights that higher paid workers take for granted. But we also need to innovate institutionally to protect worker rights still further. We know there are problem sectors in the UK economy where issue builds on top of issue and social care is a perfect case in point. Our research suggests that minimum wage underpayment is rife in the social care sector that workloads are often dangerous, and that pay progression is minimal. We need sector-specific good work agreements negotiated between employer and employee bodies to tackle the problems in sectors like this, alongside a new single enforcement body to robustly enforce labour market rights for all. A good work strategy would benefit workers in all parts of the country, and so too would more investment in infrastructure and the public realm. Birmingham, for example, urgently needs a mass transit system. Half of the area's workers cannot reach the central business district within 45 minutes today. But we should be open-eyed about the scale of the investment needed. This would require doubling the size of Birmingham's metro network and improving its bus routes at a cost of £5.4 billion by 2040. To put that into context, that vital investment is bigger than the entire levelling up fund, which currently totals 4.8 billion. Overall though, the Economy 2030 inquiry shows there's no excuse for fatalism. Other countries do better than us when it comes to growth and inequality, meaning the UK has huge catch-up potential. And we don't have to be best in class, as rich as America or as equal as Scandinavia. Just moving to a situation where the UK matches the average income and inequality of peers, such as Australia and Canada, France and Germany would see the typical UK household be £8,300 a year better off as a result. Finally, if we want to boost growth and improve the prospects of workers in local areas, we have to face up to the fact that the UK is a highly centralised economy. Local leaders can only go so far in setting priorities for growth or reducing inequalities for their residents today. If we want to see the UK take off economically, and we really do, we need to give our local leaders the political and fiscal powers to drive the long-term and strategic change that the Economy 2030 inquiry shows is so long overdue. Now we move to our second presentation on Skills Imperative 2035, Essential Skills for Tomorrow's Workforce. And we're going to hear from Lisa Morrison Coulthard and Luke Bocock from NFVR. Hi, I'm Luke Bocock, a Research Director at the National Foundation for Educational Research. And I'm Lisa Morrison Coulthard, also a Research Director at the National Foundation for Educational Research. Artificial intelligence dominated the headlines in 2023, and 2024 is likely to be no different. Technological breakthroughs will continue to change the jobs that are available in the labour market and the skills that are needed to do them. The effects of automation and artificial intelligence will be further compounded by social, environmental and economic changes, including those brought on by Brexit. These changes threaten to make existing skills challenges worse. These don't just cost the economy, they have damaging consequences for individuals who cannot access satisfying well-paid work, and they threaten to widen social inequalities. There is currently no coordinated plan across government to address the growing challenge of skills shortages. We need that strategy. But to develop it, we first need a detailed data-driven understanding of the future demand for skills and anticipated mismatches between supply and demand, particularly for the skills that will be most utilised across the labour market. We need to identify the groups in the labour market most at risk from anticipated changes 
and to understand the factors most strongly associated with young people's skill development. We also need to draw lessons from high performing countries and how their education and training systems compare with our own. Then we need to use our research insights to identify how best to respond to the challenges ahead. For example, what role can employers play and how can they be encouraged and incentivized to invest in skills development? How can government cushion the impact of structural changes in the labour market on the groups most likely to be adversely affected? And how can educators best prepare young people for jobs of the future? Together, we need to understand how we can help more individuals already in the workforce to upskill and reskill for the future, how government can help increase young people's average skills levels, and how educators can best support the development of young people's skills. The skills Imperative 2035 Essential Skills for Tomorrow's Workforce is a five-year research programme which is developing insights into each of these areas. We're two years into the programme, and, and this is just a little of what we've done and what we've learned so far. Initially, we worked with Warwick Institute for Employment Research and Cambridge Econometrics to anticipate changes in the jobs that will exist in the future. Our baseline employment projections capture the impact of both industrial and occupational change on jobs, and our alternative scenarios model the impact of a faster uptake of automation and AI. These scenarios make the same assumptions about job displacement, but different, job, uh, different assumptions about job creation. Whereas the first main scenario projects new job creation, mainly in the tech sector, the other scenario places more emphasis on job growth in education, health and care services, a human centric model. By separating out the negative and positive impacts of the adoption of automation related technologies, we show how the structure of employment is likely to be disrupted, highlighting those areas where significant job losses might be expected and contrasting them with those where job gains might be anticipated. As you can see from this chart, our projections suggest a structural change in the economy and labour market will continue slowly but steadily, impacting the jobs available and the skills needed to do those jobs. While some industry sectors are set to form a greater share of UK employment, for example, non-market services, including health and education. Others, notably manufacturing, will experience significant job destruction. Millions of jobs could be replaced by technology. Some sectors, such as transport, will experience significant displacement. Substantial changes are also expected in the occupational structure of employment. With some occupations, for example, care workers and programmers are expected to grow, whilst others, such as administrators, receptionists and warehouse operatives, are likely to decline. Most new jobs will be in professional and associate professional occupational groups, with the number of professionals growing by nearly 20% between 2020 and 2035. This trend towards continued employment growth in higher paid, higher skilled jobs coupled with a decline in lower skilled jobs is important because it increases uh, potentially the risk of displaced workers becoming unemployed unless they have or can acquire the necessary skills to upgrade into other growing areas of the labour market. To identify the skills anticipated to be most widely utilised in the labour market in 2035, we worked with economists at the University of Sheffield, combining our employment projections with profiles showing the mix of skills that will be needed across different occupational groups in the future labour market. Our research clearly identified a set of skills used most intensively employment in employment today. For example, communication, collaboration and problem solving. And projecting forward, there are changes in the relative importance of different skills, but the top 10 skills in highest demand in 2035 will be, will be broadly the same as in 2020. Demand for these skills, which we call essential employment skills, will increase across the labour market and by 2035, new jobs will be primarily created in occupations that require these skills to be most heavily utilised. Using our projections of the top skills um, for employment in 2035, together with the findings of an earlier literature review for the skills imperative 2035, we were able to identify six 
essential employment skills. These are collaboration, communication, creative thinking, information literacy, organizing, planning and prioritizing, and problem solving and decision making. Employers report experiencing a double skills gap, a lack of both technical skills and transferable essential employment skills that are crucial in the workforce. Surveys dating back to 2011 have consistently shown that employers struggle to find staff with sufficient essential employment skills when recruiting, and that they feel some people in their current workforce lack the essential employment skills they need to perform their jobs effectively. However, our understanding of skills gap, gaps in the current workforce is heavily reliant on employer perspectives, and minimal attention has been given to the possibility that workers' perspectives may not align with employers, and that the perception gaps that these perception gaps may have important implications for how to address skills gaps. We are extending the existing evidence base by gathering the missing perspective, the worker perspective, of their skills, behaviours and attitudes, and the skills needed to do their jobs effectively. To do this, we have developed the NFER Essential Employment Skills Survey, a first of its kind instrument for comparing the supply of essential employment skills with the level and importance of these skills needed in people's jobs. Over 11,000 16 to 65 year olds have responded to our survey, which will allow us to project how skills mismatches are likely to change between now and 2035. We can't wait to share um, our findings with you this spring. Our final presentation is from Berta Roenkohl and Magdalena Sofia from the Institute for the Future of Work about the Pissarides review of the future of work and well-being. Hello, I'm Magdalena Sofia, sociologist and postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for the Future of Work, focusing on the voices of workers for the Pissarides review. Hi, I'm Berta Rohenkohl and I'm an economist and postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for the Future of Work. I work with Magda on the Pissarides review and my focus is on labour market and skills. The review is looking at how new technologies are changing work, and the research that I'm involved with is examining how regions across the UK, down to the granularity of individual counties, differ in their path towards technological transformation. We are also looking at how skills requirements are evolving as a result. To help us understand these changes, we use a variety of economic and labour market data to analyse trends. A key element of this work is the construction of the UK's first disruption index. The first dimension of the index describes looking county by county the extent of technological transformation that is being experienced. We have found significant regional disparities in technological transformation factors across the country. Helping to drive that disparity are incoming flows of venture capital investments, R&D expenditure and the creation of patented technology all of which are concentrated in a very small number of regions. The second dimension of the Disruption Index measures how ready each region is to translate this digital transformation into positive change for workers. This regional innovation readiness is aggregated from measures of local education, skills levels and infrastructure factors such as the availability of high-speed digital connections. In September, we published a study led by Professor James Hayton based on a survey of a 1,000 UK firms, which asked them about the technologies that they have adopted and the impact on jobs and on job quality. A key finding was that innovation readiness significantly changed how technology adoption affected work outcomes. We found that high levels of readiness were associated with net job creation and an increase in skills requirements. Our disruption index shows that, as well as disparities in technological transformation, there are also significant disparities in readiness. That these are mainly associated with the education of the workforce skills levels and the required infrastructure. However, these disparities are not as pronounced as the technological transformation factors. When we link this work with our firm level survey, this suggests that there is likely to be untapped potential in local regions that, if invested in, could aid innovation through the development and implementation of new technologies and could see more job created with higher skills requirements. This confirms how important skills are to the emerging picture of the future of work and to improving equality across regions. 
That is why, as another part of this work stream, we are also examining changes in the skills required for jobs. We are doing this using an incredibly rich dataset of millions of online job adverts published since 2016 and using novel analysis of job descriptions to highlight trends in skills demand. So far, we have found that a great share of the new skills emerging in the market directly relate to the introduction of new technologies. We are seeing more demand for skills in IT areas like cybersecurity, AI, and cloud solutions. In parallel, there are skills that are seeing less demand, many of which relate to tasks that have been automated. We also show that the pace of skills change varies a lot by occupation. Occupations like IT directors, production engineers, and cybersecurity professionals are experiencing high, high turnover of skills. This is in contrast with slower changes in occupations like teaching, carpenters, and elementary trades. Our analysis will offer new insights into the rate of change of skills across different occupations and in different regions. Combined with the work of the Disruption Index, this should empower regional leaders and national policymakers to understand how to target investment to deliver more good work in their area. And at the individual level, it should also help workers to understand how important it is to keep developing their skills and which skills to focus on. This finding links to the work that my colleague Magdalena is doing on workers' capabilities and the impact that these technological transformations have on people's quality of life. My work looks at understanding the impacts of technological transformation on the well-being of workers, the quality of life and the quality of their jobs. We also want to understand whether there are variations in the impact across different technology types, different sectors and different locations. We have collected rich primary data through an online survey of 6,000 people and 12 focus group discussions with workers in the manufacturing, healthcare, finance and communication sectors. We are analysing this data carefully and early findings show clear evidence that the frequent use of certain technologies in day-to-day -day work has a direct effect on quality of life. This means that some technologies are having a measurable impact on people's everyday, their mobility, their pain or discomfort that they feel, and their levels of anxiety or depression. But these impacts aren't all bad. The nature of the effect depends on the nature of the technology. Our study shows that some digital technologies such as laptops, tablets, smartphones and real-time messaging tools are associated with an improved quality of life for workers. This might be because of what we call job complementarity. So interacting with these technologies opens up learning opportunities, improves a person's efficiency at work and the ways that they can connect to people and resources, helping them to manage their workload better and increasing their sense of achievement at work. However, we have also found that the frequent use of some of the newer workplace technologies, such as wearables, software technologies that use AI and machine learning, as well as automated machines and robotic technologies, may be negatively impacting the quality of life of UK-based workers. We su suspect that this negative impact on quality of life is driven by increased levels of anxiety. Firstly, there is fear of job substitution, so that the increase of use of technologies will eventually replace jobs, bringing worries about job security. Secondly, these technologies are often accompanied by an increase in the surveillance of workers and a decrease in the discretion that they are able to exercise as they do their job. This may result in a lower sense of agency and autonomy and poorer quality of job. We started our analysis with an understanding that the impact of technological resources and commodities would depend on a series of contextual and structural factors. More specifically, our hypothesis was that some of the impacts of technological innovation on workers' well-being and quality of life would be mediated by changes in the quality of their jobs. We measured this change in job quality by considering a range of job characteristics. This included extrinsic factors such as pay levels and working time arrangements, as well as intrinsic, intrinsic aspects such as the level of discretion afforded to workers, their ability to use their skills and apply their own ideas, the opportunity to advance their career, the capability to establish supportive working relationships, and the ability to work in physically and socially safe environments. 
These and other capabilities may be key to workers to adapting to technological transformations in a way that allows them to flourish and live fulfilling working lives. So looking to the future, we know that preliminary findings from other work streams in the Pissaries Review, particularly the work surveying UK firms and the construction of the Disruption Index, suggests that regional characteristics and other meso-level factors such as organizational culture and HR policy may also play an important role in enhancing workers' capabilities and their ability to adapt to new technologies. With our data, we will drill down into these contextual differences. Full results of our analysis will be available in the spring of 2024, and we look forward to sharing more then. It is a fast-moving space with so many new technologies evolving, so it is important that we understand the human consequences. Our work will make a significant contribution to helping innovation and social progress advance together. Well, thank you to those five presenters. We're going to move now from those introductory presentations into our first panel, which is chaired by Tim Gardham, CEO of the Nuffield Foundation. During the panel, do please add your questions to the Q&A area of Zoom, and then I'll be bringing those in to the panel towards the end. So I'll hand over to you now, Tim. Thanks very much, Emily. Now, um, I've got with me, sitting next to me, it's Chris Pissarides of the Pissarides Review. And Jude Hillary is here in the middle from the Skills Imperative, and James Smith from the Resolution Foundation um, is on the end. And uh, I think the opportunity we have now is to stitch together these three really interesting complementary views and approaches to the same, uh, same questions, the same themes. These are three of the Foundation's definitional projects. You might say that's why we've spent £7 million on them. And they really pull together, I think, a theme which has not only been critical to the way Nuffield has looked at its agenda for the past five years, but will inevitably be as critical in the next five. And that's why part of our intention today is to look ahead and say, what are the questions that emerge from this research? What are the further questions of research that we should be taking forward um, in the years ahead? Because this clearly defines in the future of work and well-being, the future of the British economy, um, what goes on in terms of our education, these are the themes central to Nuffield's uh, purpose. And what struck me, actually, was we have Resolution's macro picture, which is no nothing less than the strategic uh, shaping of the British economy, linking to the NFER's micro approach to what are these skills and aptitudes that we need to identify if that macro ambition is to take place. And Chris, it seems to me that the, the Prisarides review underpins both these with pretty fundamental questions about the nature of AI and technological change and the implications of the quality of work and the quality of skills that are needed. And so before we um, take audience questions, before we look at those questions of the nature of skills and in particular the importance of place, which I think dominates a lot of this discussion, I'd just like to stand back for a moment and ask you, Chris, there's a, a, something that Magna and Berta said right at the end there that innovation and social progress advance together. And I think the question I'd like to ask you is, how far is this exponential wave of innovation that we're seeing with digital technologies and AI different in kind to previous moments of technological disruption and change? I mean, if I was sitting here not talking to you, but say to Sir John Stuart Mill at the end of the 19th century, uh, he would probably have looked back for all the suffering of the 19th century innovation and social progress and advance together. Do you think that is in doubt? Do you think that, um, or is it something which is likely to happen? Is it preordained, in other words? Well, it's a, it's a very good question, and thank you very much for asking. But first, let me thank the Nafit Foundation for their uh, generosity of uh, funding this and how grateful we are to be put together with these uh, other complementary groups. As you said, it's absolutely the case there is Macro, there is micro, and we're discovering that there is both, and <laughs> we're putting them together. Uh, now, in, in terms of, uh, of, of the innovation, I, I absolutely agree that, um, that this time is different, but not different for the reasons that we hear very often in the media, that there has never been anything like this, it's bigger than before, and all that. I don't think we can rank um, technological innovations, those size and influence until much later in their life, and we are not there yet with AI. 
Where it's different is that uh, John Stuart Mill and uh, Keynes, I would have thought up to um, the very recent times, up, up to Alan Turing, if you like, <laughs> Um, they would have said that uh, technological innovation and uh, social progress are, go are going together. The, the best example in my view is electricity. When electricity was invented, we could um, light up our streets, we could electrify our homes, uh, and, and eventually, in fact soon after, we had access to a whole wealth of uh, domestic appliances that made domestic work much easier. It freed loads and loads of uh, domestic uh, workers, uh, mostly women. It freed them to, from those low productivity jobs in the home, some of them unpaid, if, if, if they were members of a family, and go out in the market and do other things they wanted, and for sure they found more, more interesting. That's not the case with um, AI. Here we, we have a choice how to apply it. In, in some sense, we, we don't need it in a sense to carry on. You know, we, 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 we have been fine, thank you very much, without it. But given that we have it, we can use it to our benefit and to achieve uh, much more greatness, if you like, in, in, in our social uh, life. But unfortunately, uh, it's also open to um, abuse and things that would set us back. And it's up to us how, how to do it. Uh, I can give you many, many examples. I can, I can take just one very simple and very quick because I realize that there will be other interesting things to, that we hear over there. I, I mean, take, take drones. Drones are um, wonderful devices if you want to identify distant forest fires and deal with them quickly. In agriculture, they have uh, a lot of use. You can identify areas of uh, ripe produce. So you, you target your collections. You send robots to collect it, like related technology. Uh, you could identify dry areas. So you water them. Uh, you, you target your watering. You don't just uh, open the floodgates and flood all the uh, fields because somewhere they might need water. All, all those things are beneficial for the environment, for the productivity of agriculture, for everything else. But at the same time, drones could be developed into the lowest cost uh, uh, mass killing devices because they are not uh, manned. They go there independently. It doesn't matter if you lose them and they can do a lot of damage. Also, this sort of bifurcation, uh, Magda was saying in that presentation just now, applies to the workplace too. I was very interested by her differentiation between the shorthand, what she called smartphone technology, mm -hmm. which increase um, empowerment and efficiency in people's working lives. And then those other technologies which increase anxiety, which are quite coercive, surveillance and less discretion, which seem to undermine agency. And I was wondering how you see this. To what extent is there a capacity in this dig uh, digital transformation to actually reduce productivity and to, and to um, lessen work satisfaction and, he and hence the well-being that you're looking for? The, 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 there are devices that complement labor. Um, uh, smartphone devices could do that. Of course, it could also be abused. This is not looking, taking it out and talking to your friends. Uh, so that's another you know, we need to be aware of. Um, what we are finding is evidence that uh, workers like the complementary devices, which are laptops, communication, either phone or other means. Um, but they feel threatened, partly thinks that um, they don't understand what they're doing and what the intentions of management uh, are. And uh, that's where communication becomes very important. Um, treating workers as, as your stakeholders, as a part of the group that is uh, producing whatever the um, company wants to produce. Um, or devices that they obviously see that they could be doing the things that they are doing and therefore they might be losing their jobs. And, and, and at the same time, communication again it would help. And what would especially help there, and, and would completely remove this fear, 
is a good system of um, training and adaptation to the technologies that uh, uh, the company might have. And um, uh, we have examples of companies that are doing it. They are the champions of the future. That's where workers feel happier. But the majority of companies are not doing it. And, and I think given what we've been finding, I think the failure here is in, is in management. Um, it, it's the management system that we have, especially in this country, actually. The Americans and the Germans are doing better, I think, there. Uh, ma managers are, don't get themselves involved with uh, uh, their workers and at their workplace to the extent that there will be free exchange of ideas and free role changing, training, uh, so that any equipment that comes in becomes complementary to labor rather than uh, competitive. It could be done. The CBI admit that it's very difficult. We know is that I would be better, but we don't know how to do it. That's in print. It's not something I heard confidentially from them. Um, and um, I, I think that's where we should be focusing. That's interesting because um, not only the issue of management, the issue of policy too, James, listening to the Resolution Foundations putting forward its um, vision, the issue of good work and how good work in policy is enshrined is absolutely critical to this, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And the, the, I think the really big thing about all this is we have, we have all this change, which uh, Chris is, is talking about. We have, um, you know, some of the shocks and the legacy of this period of stagnation that we've had uh, since the financial crisis. And coming with that is this really high inequality. So um, uh, not only do we have incomes that have barely grown over the past 15 years? We have uh, incomes for particularly the bottom half um, of the distribution that are doing worse than in other countries. And that really, that really sort of stands out. And when you try and think about both of those things, obviously, we, we have to think about what's happening with technology, where productivity might go in the future. But what's happening right now is productivity is stagnating. And when you look at why productivity is stagnating, which really stands out um, when you compare the UK to other countries is the sort of distributional aspect of this geographically. So um, our cities, our big cities outside of London um, uh, are doing much worse than those in some other key countries. So if you look at Manchester's level of productivity compared to London, it's about a third lower. If you look at Lyon compared to Paris, it's more like uh, 20%. So um, there's really big differences. And we're an economy, as we've been hearing about, that is well-placed to um, you know, take on new technologies. We have specialisms, and we heard, as we heard about, in the presentation that focus on the on the service sector I think that the UK is um, amazingly the the world's second biggest exporter of services given the size of the country it's obviously you know quite an achievement and, ha and really doubling down on that and uh, trying to uh, trying to use that to leverage good jobs um, and then using policy to turn that into higher living standards across the board. That feels like the, the, uh, the, the real heart of uh, what's a combination of things that can address that low income, high inequality problem that we've got. Come back I think, to place and geography in a moment, because that's clearly key to this. But I think what's striking is how both from the uh, disruption index and the future of work, the skills and job matching from NFER and Resolution's uh, commitment to the doubling down on the service economy, it takes us to the critical issue of what sort of skills as well as what sort of jobs. I'm going to turn to Jude now, that we saw in two of those presentations, clearly, as you put it, the growth is going to be in professional and associated professional jobs. That there will be need for expertise in technological literacy, cybersecurity, AI, um, cloud solutions. I think what's interesting about your work is it suggests that essential employment skills are much broader than that. And I'm quite interested for you to um, say a little bit more about what I thought was a really interesting insight, that a lot of the skills that we're teaching now are going to be equally in demand, but we're going to need more of them. And so in this question of continuity and change, where are you, where's your research taking you on this? So... Um uh, I just echo Chris's um, uh, sentiment at the beginning. Uh, thanks very much to the National Foundation for um, uh, 
funding is a really exciting project. We've looked at, we started out by looking at what jobs are likely to exist in the future. So we forecasted the, what the labor market might look like in 2035. And then from that, we, we forecast what the skills will be needed to do those jobs. And um, what we found actually um, was that the top 20 skills that you know, are in use today are actually going to be the same skills that are going to be needed in the future. And we, we identified the top six, actually, which we call the essential employment skills, which, you know, were mentioned on the film there, um, which, uh, you know, as I sort of say, they're, they're the skills which are in most demand today. Um, so, so what's so exciting about that finding? Well, the, the thing is, actually, what we're going to need is more of those skills, but also a higher level of those skills. And the reason we need a higher level of those skills is much of the job growth that we're forecasting in the next 15 years by 2035 is actually at the top end of the occupational hierarchy. So it's professional jobs and um, uh, associate professional jobs and to a lesser extent caring and leisure jobs, um, occupations. Most of the other um, uh, occupations, particularly those at the bottom, are going to see a decline in their relative share of jobs in the, in the economy in future. Well, then take in the case of care and health, mm -hmm. there you have traditionally low paid jobs, which are going to increase um, in number, mm -hmm. but not necessarily in reward. Yes. Well, you know, we, we haven't looked at those sort of micro, micro effects, but um, yes, um, with an aging population, you, you would expect there to be an increased focus on care in the future. And, you know, with people having potentially more money at the top end of the distribution, leisure options. But in, but in terms of, um, if you like, teaching these skills, mm -hmm. uh, collaboration, communication, creativity, problem solving, mm -hmm. they're much more broad spectrum yeah. than, for instance, um, I'm going to turn to Chris here, actually, because um, I saw a really interesting interview you did with Bloomberg uh, just at the end of last year, where you challenged the Prime Minister on the emphasis in increasing STEM subjects, saying, actually, the sorts of skills that we need in an AI world should not be defined just as STEM skills, they're far more multifaceted than that. Mm. Um, do you say a bit more about that? Yeah, um, I, mean, I, I, I absolutely believe that, actually, based on the, on the basis of, uh, of our work. Uh, I mean, because of computers and programming and new things coming on the market all the time, we think, oh, wow, you know, we're going to learn STEM, we're going to do the next programming, we're going to have a startup, and we're going to become very rich and very famous very quickly. It, it, it just doesn't work like that. A very small number of people might do it, but the vast majority of jobs will need uh, what, what I call in the interview, actually, empathy uh, skills. Uh, th there is, the, um, th there is the, the, the health issue. There are the person-to-person -person, uh, services. You know what uh, you call people skills, I think, yeah. <laughs> in, in, in the video. And, uh, and, and that's where we should be specializing or uh, other office jobs. Now, we, we, sh we do need some technical skill. We, we do need mathematics. It doesn't matter. Forget mathematics now and never again. Or forget how to do basic computing. Whatever job you get, you need to know how to work with, the, with basic software. But whereas when we were looking at skills, we were looking at uh, millions of advertising, as, as Bertha said. And, and when you look back... Even six years ago, the main skill that was required in uh, computing was the uh, internet browsing uh, ability to deal with uh, platform, uh, retail platforms, uh, being able to work with Microsoft uh, Word and spreadsheets. Th those are not mentioned anymore because they're part of our basic knowledge. But you, 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 do need to, you do need to know how to use the Microsoft Office, so any job you get. But, that, but that's not what we mean by STEM. You, you don't need the, the very highly qualified ones because you, know, you, you, learn, you become a super programmer, you learn programming, you develop some uh, super AI project, and then that project does the programming much better than you. I mean, look at ChatGPT, it's much better programming than most. And that's why I use the phrase that uh, many STEM skills are sowing the seeds of their, of their own destruction. So, I mean, taking that to you, Jude, as you have this uh, quote, there's no coordinated plan across government to address the growing challenge of skill shortages. It seems to be a separate question, too. Is, are we, is government clear? Are we clear about the nature of the education that we should be providing? Well, I mean, uh, 
that that is one of the challenges. So I, I would I would argue that they're they're not there yet. Certainly, um, the, the education system very much is about acquiring knowledge, um, uh, and there's a lot of noise about it needing to um, um, develop skills in the future. And um, but you know there there are a lot of challenges already with the education system um, uh, in this country. You know we. We, you know, we have this enormous disadvantage gap, which is actually worse than it's been for the last decade. Um, the, our post-16 outcomes are, 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 um, uh, are very poor compared to internationally. And actually one aspect of this job, or this, this project that we're leading, is actually going to be looking at what we can learn from other countries about how, what they're doing to develop these essential employment skills. So, um, but there's a, there's a big conversation to be had, actually, um, and we're bringing the evidence to bear. Um, we haven't hit the education bit yet of our study, but we're certainly going to be looking at some of these things, such as how people, young people develop skills while in education and how um, skills develop depending on different routes that you take, in, take from education to work, et cetera, which will hopefully inf inform in, um, this debate. But certainly, without having done the research, I, I think one of the big questions will be how are we going to how are we going to um, help our young people to develop these essential employment skills while they're in the education system? And almost certainly that's going to take you into discuss discussions about the curriculum. It's really worth sort of highlighting the importance of this because one third of the, um, of the people who have been in the labor market in 2035 will be joining in the next 10 to 15 years. So, you know, it's really important that we make sure these young people are joining the labor market with the skills that they're going to need. This also now should take us to place, and it should take us to the issue of geographic uh, regional dis disparities too. Now, you've already said, James, you've talked about the second city problem as, as key to um, your analysis, the problems of Birmingham and Manchester just not being comparable to Toulouse and Lyon. Um, you also said the economy needs to double down on the service sector. Uh, as I quote you, um, Martin Wolf from the FT, who's been hugely complimentary of your work, um, he seems to have cannibalised it for a host of articles. Um, but he was grumpy at one stage when he um, <laughs> said of your analysis, this priority looks ideal for skilled professionals living predominantly in London. What would it mean for the less skilled living elsewhere? And he went on, how does the promotion of high wage services generate income across the country, which would surely end up concentrating more population and wealth in London and the South East? The scale of shift that you're acquiring is quite colossal, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And, uh, you know, I, there's a, um, uh, certainly a grain of truth in what Martin is saying there. So what, what we're doing is we're looking at how you would improve productivity, what really stands out, what are the big gains that you, you would have to make. And improving services, um, working in your, in your big cities, because that's where services thrive. So you take the strength of the UK um, in terms of its um, very clear international um, advantages in terms of producing services, and you combine it with where we're weakest geographically, and you bring those two ideas together. And then really trying to address that is a coordinated um, you know, it's city design, it's transport, it's skills, it's migration, you know, it, and it's thinking about change and, and how things move forward. But I, I think it's very important. I mean, we, we touched on, on social care, for example, as um, an area that's clearly going to grow as society ages. What I think we need to do is, is um, really think about how to generate good jobs that will provide um, high levels of income, living standards going forward, and you know will drive will drive growth overall. And doing that is really focusing job growth in your growing sectors. So that's that's your services strategy, that's our cities. But it's also thinking about how you make sure there are good jobs all across the economy. So, for example, in, um, uh, in making sure that you enforce standards across the labour market, making sure people have hours contracts that reflect the actual hours they work. So zero hours contracts being the most egregious example there. So making sure that you don't have jobs with poor uh, uh, prospects in terms of pay and training um, in any sectors, including you know, the, the sectors are going to be spread beyond cities. So I think there's a very, there's very much a cities, uh, cities focus in terms of growth strategy, but I think 
the offer has to be beyond cities. It has to be good jobs uh, in places around the country, not just in cities and not just services. So services obviously are very important, but you know the UK has a um, you know clear uh, strengths in the manufacturing sectors as well that we can we can double down on and bringing together trade, geography, um, and labour market policies with a range of other policies. That's what the Economy 2030 inquiry is all about. And I think, you know, it, it's really to the credit of Nuffield, LSE, who we've worked with, the Resolution Foundation, that we think in that joined up way. And that's the, that's the way we're really going to break out of some of the problems you described earlier. Coming briefly, Chris, I know we've got some questions of coming. I'm going to invite Emily in to ask them in a moment. But Chris, what did you want to add? One thing we intend to do more of, because we're seeing some science in the data, is that, is that Manchester and the Mer Merseyside Lancashire area, they are showing signs of, uh, of, of revival in new technologies and attracting uh, investments in, um, in, in these new you know, venture capital investments. Uh, it, it's the first signs that we see of that kind of activity outside London and, and, and and I agree with Martin Wolf actually in that it's very difficult to break the monopoly of London in uh, business services and uh, finance. I'm not even sure if it's worth breaking it actually, because you do need this agglomeration, you know. But but there are things, uh, new age manufacturing and all that that could be done elsewhere, and we're seeing signs that at least the Manchester area is picking that up, and we intend to do a lot more work in the final months of our project on that. This is what Keith, this is what Keith Burnett will pick up with the, uh, with the second panel in a moment. Uh, precisely these um, these uh, issues. But I'm now going to uh, turn to Emily, who's been listening to what people who are listening want to talk yes, to us about. Yes, yes, and thank you very much to everyone who has <coughs> the questions. We've had some really fascinating ones, and I'd like to begin first of all, um, Jude, if I may um, pose one to you. We've heard a lot about regional and local areas and the importance of those in, in what we're talking about. We haven't heard a great deal about the extent to which all the projects um, have covered the whole of the UK or not. And I wondered if you could just say a few words about um, the extent to which perhaps Skills Imperative has and uh, what's the same, what's different, what, what do we need to be thinking about? So um, the Skills Imperative um, does to some extent cover the UK and in some places covers um, just England and there are good reasons for that. Um, so the labour market projections that we produce, um, uh, we have in, in conjunction with yourselves and with DFE, we produce subnational um, uh, breakdowns by country and by um, regions within country, um, also by mayoral combined authorities, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's a very good place to start if you're looking at changes between, um, between, um, between countries. Um, and um, it's been a while since I've looked at the differences between countries, but um, certainly I think England will see most of the growth alongside Scotland, um, if I remember correctly. But um, uh, in other areas of, of the study, um, we've, we've looked primarily at England, and that's primarily to do with the data sets that are available, which they're not comparable between Scotland and, and, and well, other countries outside of England. So you're not able to do the same analysis, but um, where we can, we are looking across the piece. So, um, but, you know, in terms of the skills that are needed, um, uh, you know, in, in England, the essential employment skills that we're talking about, you know, these are the ones which are most in demand in England now. Um, we think they're going to be most in demand in England, England in the future. We have no reason to believe that that's not the case in other countries within the within the um, within the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and if I might just change tack a bit, because we've got so many different um, topics raised. Um, Chris, we had a question around the efficiency uh, benefits, potential benefits of new technologies, and the extent to which those are shared evenly between employees and employers. And one question specifically from, from Joe Ryle about what promise AI and technology has for a shorter working week. Is that something that um, has come up at all in your review of around well-being and job satisfaction? Yeah, it, it, it has come up. It, it, it has come up a lot, actually, because um, th there would be uh, the, the opportunity to save uh, working hours. Now, some people interpret that, interpret that as loss of jobs. I don't think that's where it's going to show up. I think it's going to show up as changing roles and, uh, 
and, and a set of tasks that people can do within a company. And because the expectation is that productivity will go up in uh, adopting AI and the, and the new automation uh, technologies, uh, one way of uh, taking those extra gains is in the form of fewer hours of work uh, rather than uh, higher pay. Obviously, you cannot have both <laughs> unless you have vast in, uh, increases in productivity. And, and there is support for that. Uh, for that, we see it in surveys of workers that they'd love to have more flexibility. Uh, many have seen a survey recently about 30% of workers would love a four day week. Um, and uh, we're moving in that direction. We do know that with uh, countries that experience uh, increases in productivity, they do uh, reduce their hours of work. So I see that moving in that direction, either an extra day off or in the flexibility in the time, working from home, a few hours. In that mm, interesting. It's a hugely topical area, so I'm sure we'll hear mm -hmm. lots more about that. Um, James, if I could turn to you, um, we've had a few questions around um, the employer perspective on this. And in particular, why, why is it that employers are investing less in skills over time when what we're hearing today is that the labour market's moving towards um, higher skilled work? Why, why is that and, and what do you think can be done about it? Yeah, it's a really key topic there. So, um, you know, if you look at the UK relative to other countries, what really stands out in terms of looking at the differences and how productive we are is, uh, it's if, say, if you compare to a country like France, um, workers have much less physical capital, um, you know, software, computers, but also buildings and, and plant and machinery and that sort of thing than, than those other countries. That's a key, key thing that's holding holding us back. And part of that's about the weakness of the economy. Part of that is about, uh, that we've had uh, since the financial crisis, part of that's about um, some of the policy issues, so high uncertainty post-referendum. Uh, 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 that, that's all been um, a, a big headwind to investment. But there's really key things that I think, you know, we don't talk much about, like um, ownership of firms. We don't have particularly strong ownership of firms. We don't have good incentives to reallocate um, highly productive workers or uh, physical capital to more productive firms. So trying to reduce and um, uh, get some of the bottlenecks out of that system. So we can do that through the tax system, you do that through the planning system, but really, you know, thinking beyond the very obvious things that are, are, are up in lights holding back investment, I think is key. Mm, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Um, and then we had a question which I thought was was really interesting about um, this challenge that there's something of a disconnect between the, um, the predictions of skills demand and what people see as the kind of real actual labour market where there are a lot of low skilled jobs and a lot of people coming out of education system, as you mentioned in the Economy 2030 inquiry, but with, with low skills. So, what, it, what is it that explains that? How should we be thinking about that? Is there anything that anyone wants, wants to add around that? So skills, so I think. <laughs> well, um, so one of the things we did actually, as, as you know, Emily, is we've, we've, we've done this employer skill survey, sorry, employee skill survey. Generally speaking, when you ask, or when you, the, the sources of information out there about skills, um, it's the employer's perspective. We've, we've done the opposite. We've asked um, employees about their essential skills. And, um, and what, the, without sort of letting the cat out of the bag, what we found, what we found actually is, is that um, there, there is a, a skills un, underutilization uh, of, 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 of employees. Um, and it's the same employer, employee occupational groups, actually, that employers are often reporting sort of um, skills gaps on. So, there seems to be a miscommunication there, maybe, that we need to sort of understand. And we're thinking about that at the moment, about how we're going to present that in the next, next working paper. But it does seems that, to be... Reflect what Chris was saying about the management issue, uh, issues of in, in UK management, perhaps, mm. that's the point. So, uh, I just about to sort of say that it's consistent with both of what these, um, these other studies are sort of saying. So, um, so um, but it's, it's, it's giving that employer, um, employee perspective. So that's really interesting. Thank you so much for that. I think we're pretty much out of time, Tim, so back to you. Well, I think we now are going to break, Lungs Emily, for my instructions here. Um, I'd like to thank our panel very much indeed for a 
fascinating discussion of their projects and where they lead. Um, as I said, uh, for us, our great ambition here is to see, as a result of these conversations, new ideas coming to us at Nuffield, and uh, ideas that reach across from the research community to those in government and employers uh, to have a sort of joint enterprise in our work to identify the evidence that we need to be able to bring these policies into effect um, in, in the way that they will um, make a difference. And so that's what the second panel is going to be about. We have uh, the chair of Nuffield Foundations, Keith Burnett, uh, being joined in five minutes, but I think for now we have a five minute break. Welcome back from the break, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much for your questions in, in Zoom. Please do keep those coming. Um, we've had some really fantastic questions and um, do keep those coming for the second panel. And again, I'll bring them in um, towards the end. Thanks also for the contributions to the Slido, the responses to our questions <laughs> to you. We really want to know what you think. So please do add to that as well. And now I'm delighted to pass to the chair for our second panel, um, Professor Sir Keith Burnett, who's going to introduce, um, say a few words and introduce our panel, Keith. Well, thanks again. Thanks for coming back. It's, it's a real delight, actually, to move to this second part of our webinar because we've got some great people who've been listening and thinking about the research that we've been hearing about. So um, we had a fantastic presentations by the research groups uh, that we're funding from Nuffield, but we thought it'd be wonderful if we can hear from the perspective of people who've got experience with the issues on the ground, as it were. Um, I'm here, which is my background, is actually I'm a quantum physicist. Given now you probably know what quantum is now. Uh, I didn't many years ago. But the reason why this is so important to me, I should say, is I come from a family of industrialists in South Wales. My father ran the Ronda Group Training Association. And my father-in-law was principally responsible for the construction parts of the Margam Works in Port Talbot. So my whole my background was actually in skills and technology. And then I had a most wonderful time at the University of Sheffield, where I was involved with a very, very powerful example of where you could use uh, new skills, new technologies to develop jobs locally in Sheffield and AMRC. I also worked closely with the city councils of, of Sheffield, Rotherham and also Barnsley. So um, it's really great actually to have the people, I'll go around the screen and I'll start with Jürgen, Professor Jürgen Mai, because he's somebody who is an incredibly strong supporter of the way the technology, both the experience in Siemens, but also in the study you did for the government on smart skills and manufacturing, but also now the Northern Powerhouse. Very welcome to you, Jürgen. Um, Kirsten, now um, from, from from Bradford, again, one of my favorite places, Bradford. <laughs> um, when I was last there, I was at the Alhambra, but also wonderful countryside and capability around it. So thank you very much, Kirsten, for coming here today and talking about the perspectives you have. I'm sorry if I know all these places, but again, Doncaster. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much. Wonderful. I mean, I know really how powerful a logistics center Doncaster is, uh, how wonderful the communications are there as well. So great you come here as the Chamber of Commerce to explain about it. And also we have Richard Brooks from Birmingham City Council who's involved then with looking at the partnerships as well through the city. So I think we have a, a, a great um, panel here. And what we've asked them to do is uh, just to give a few minutes short things of their perceptions of how things are going around in, in that way. I hope you're ready to do that, people. So we're going to start with, with, with Jürgen, if you'd lead off and blast away, Jürgen. Yeah, sure. And uh, great to see you. Um, Keith and, uh, and like you say what a, what a fabulous panel to join to give that sort of Midlands and Northern uh, perspective of what we've just been hearing about on the research and uh, um, you know I mean one of the things that, that, that clearly came through from me from, from all of the previous speakers was that you know we are devoid of a, of a proper national strategy um, for for where we go on uh, on skills, um, I didn't hear 
quite as much about industrial strategy. And given you're an industrialist, uh, Keith, and I'm an industrialist, <laughs> mm. um, you know, I'd like to take the conversation maybe just back slightly to that point, because I think, you know, almost before you can create a, uh, a skill strategy, you do need to have the the industrial and the technology strategy, actually, it's technologies and it's, it's, it's industry, you know, and, and look, Keith, you just, you just, you know, raised where, you know, your, your dear father started his technology career at Port Talbot. And look, I mean, that's in the headlines at the moment. Why is it in the headlines? It's because, you know, for the last 20 years, we never created a proper industrial strategy to manage the transformation of UK steel industry from a high carbon, a high energy intensive industry to a lower carbon, um, greener um, industry. And of course, you know, many other nations have had those strategies, so they are now more competitive than we are. Um, so the UK can no longer afford to have blast furnaces. And unfortunately, we're closing it down, mm. um, you know, and, uh, and, and, and so it's the absence of that sort of industrial strategy. And of course, once you create a strategy, if you do it right, and you create what are the new jobs that are going to come, then, of course, you need to develop what the uh, what the skills uh, uh, strategy yeah. is. Um, the, the the other thing that uh, you know was mentioned quite a lot in the previous panels was sort of demand strategy, um, and uh, you know, and this I find very interesting. You know, having worked for a long time in industry in this country, but also in Germany and uh, and, and Austria, and uh, you know, we just don't have a demand based skills strategy. And if I can just very quickly explain the Austrian model, because I actually think it's easier than the German model. In Austria, you sort of, you still have a national um, network of job centers. It's basically what they are. Um, but the job centers act as more than just a job center. The job center is the center that is responsible for coordinating demand and supply mm. between local employers and local skills providers. And because that is the system, and because that's the system that has existed for like 40 years, mm -hmm. every employer knows it's their responsibility to give their demand of skills into mm -hmm. that system mm -hmm. once a year, um, you know, and it's once a year for what is required over the next five years. So there mm -hmm. is a, you know, there's a map and people know of what's going to come. And it's actually, it's incredibly simple, isn't it? You know, mm. why can't we do something as simple as that? Mm. And instead, you know, we sort of, you know, keep inventing new and fragmenting things. So, mm. you know, that was that was one thing, you know, can, what can we put in place that's really, uh, that's really very simple. And then the final point, you know, because uh, I've only got a couple of minutes. Mm. My final point is um, that, you know, we really, really do need to prioritize apprenticeships, further education um, and, uh, you know, and technology skills more. Um, you know, I was just looking up the statistics and in the UK, it is now 4% of our workforce that go through a formal apprenticeship route, 4%. And actually the number has dropped off since we introduced mm. the apprenticeship mm. levy. Mm. Great policy that was. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and in most um industrial nations and again you know uh, whether that's france or uh, france was mentioned in in, in your discussions uh, or germany you know it's somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of people that go through those sorts of you know technology apprenticeships and by the way that's technology arts crafts yeah, yeah, yeah. um you know it, 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 it's it's quite sense. a year uh, abroad and we just need to have find something that is a complete reset um, you know, in terms of that, not all of the skills that are required, especially where we're going in the future, mm. um, is of that, you know, fundamental academic need. Um, you know, a lot of it is academic mixed with, you know, technical skills and actually is very much mixed with, again, what another piece of your research was talking about, and I wrote it down here, is the skills of collaboration, problem solving and communication. You know, so it's more of those sorts of skills. And a lot of that tends to come through, you know, what I would call sort of apprenticeships for their education type uh, training. So I'll leave my, my yeah, initial yeah. opening remarks there and look forward to the discussion. No, thank you, Jürgen. I mean, I very strongly agree with the point of view you're putting forward. Kirsten, do you want to pick up some of those ideas or your own perspectives on? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you, Keith. And again, great to be part of this. And actually, 
I had a brief encounter with the Resolution Foundation's work as part of the advisory panel. So I've had Great. my arguments with Thorsten Bell in terms <laughs> of the overwhelming focus on service sector and not looking yeah. at the, the place of the manufacturing sector and the wider non-market sectors, although I think my experience of social care has been quite marketized in some senses. But anyway, that, that said, um, and I was a bit struck by the lack of looking at uh, the whole of the UK because if I was to look at the Centre for Cities um, report this week, it does show a real difference in Scot Scottish performance of Dundee, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Glasgow in terms of graduate pools of labour yeah. yeah. and productivity. And actually, I think we need to be more interested in England. And I say that probably as a Scot with a bit of bias, you know, but in, in what is happening in Scotland, and that's not to decry the levels of deprivation. But anyway, look, um, I want to say a little bit about... Um, Bradford, and then some of the frustration that we continue to look at the levels of disparity that we look at and some of the thoughts I have about the kind of policy direction that would be helpful, but then also the research questions. Um, and the thing to think about, Bradford, you mentioned the Alhambra, we're going to be city culture. Put that to one side. Mm -hmm. We're the youngest city in this country. Wow. You know, we are 35% under the age of 20. Uh, we're globally connected, 150 languages spoken we are digital natives largely um, and hugely entrepreneurial. That has to be um, a huge asset for the growth of not just the North UK and the productivity journey. So why are we looking at such stuck statistics that show, mm. you know, that, that kind of the level of disparity that continues? Because the UK's performance on these metrics is powerless. But if you to look at the north of England and Jorgen and, and Dan and I know this for well, it's weird at the bottom then, mm. therefore, of a powerless situation. Something dramatic has to shift. And I think if you were to look at further research, looking at some of the shifts that are needed, for example, the 1.6 billion funding gap in kind of research that's directed into northern HEIs that mm. are hugely capable of being part of the future, have great capabilities, but the Golden Triangle continues to hoover mm. up the bulk of the research and the impact of that then is lessened and so on. But there are other other absolute disparities. And look, I know how hard local authorities, combined authorities, chambers of commerce, colleges, universities are now working across the north, actually, but certainly I have most experience at Leeds City Region on employment skills strategies, trying to get give young people um, experience of the workplace around all the occupations that, that are possible. You know, we're trying to flex the apprentice levy so we pull it and share it. But these are workarounds. The curriculums don't exist. The structures for the apprentice levy uh, is not good. You know, I know University of Bradford, number one country for social mobility, produces more graduates that go into higher professional entrepreneurial destinations than anywhere else in the north of England. But and but and more postgraduate students studying AI. You know, and there are mm -hmm. many other mm -hmm. assets for this productivity. Um, thing, but it's precarity, which I think was mentioned um, mm -hmm. first up, wasn't it, in the Resolution Foundation, mm -hmm. with a lack of strategic framework. Jorgen's referred to a funding model that's broken. Look, I was talking to a vice chancellor who said they've lost a thousand students due to the visa changes, and you mm -hmm. know the the, mm -hmm. the universities at the moment are hugely dependent on international income because the fee hasn't been lifted because the fee structure isn't yeah. working, yeah. and so you've got an immediate you know, kind of sh constant shifting blockchain sees local authorities that are looking at bankruptcy. I mean, then maybe mm. Richard wants to say something of it. It's not that bankruptcy as such, but huge precarity in their finances and devolution, which is really decentralization with some notable exceptions. And that said, we're maxing out on what we can do. So completely agree, Jorgen, around the strategy, employment skills and the transport investment, because uh, yeah, the, again, on the research has talked about Birmingham and the transport system. You know, Bradford is the fifth biggest city in, in England, and it's not on a national rail connection. You shunt in mm -hmm. and out. So that's why we've made such a big case around mm -hmm. connectivity. But I have to mention, you know, before you even get off the ground on any of these agendas, we've talked about fiscal reform, business rates, council tax, revenue raising powers, flexibilities, devolution, proper devolution to unlock the potential of sub-regional systems. Got got to happen. Um, something we haven't mentioned, I just feel I should mention, is um, the early years system, which is, has been desiccated. And actually, if you don't get children by the age of seven, um, actually equipped with some of these basic skills around communication, collaboration, interaction with others. Um, and there's been huge underinvestment over the last 10 years. 
they are not going to learn through the school system. Um, innovation in the school curriculum is absolutely not for purpose. It takes forever. The regulatory bodies are slow to then recognise and accredit new forms of qualification. Huge amount to do around all of that. I'd also just, I'm the chair of the Young Foundation, which of course does huge amounts of research around community, but the need to reinvest in the hyper-local and the pathways into employment to those furthest from the labour market, if we are really going to tackle regional disparities. It doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's, this is a whole system solution that is um, absolutely needed. Um, and then the inclusive growth dimension of the new economy just needs, as I say, who benefits from technological change and innovation in this. So very quickly, I was going to turn to how research can aid. I think it's crucial. Um, I'm director of the Yorkshire Policy Engagement Research Network, which is systematically building relationship between um, universities and the local and combined authorities and defining research agendas and connecting them to policy development and investment decisions. Um, and uh, should we be successful, watch the space for Yorkshire Policy Innovation Partnership, um, which is specific, it's £5 million to invest in looking at inclusive growth, transition to a green economy, living sustainability. So we are building locally active research systems at regional and sub-regional level. I also directed the Bradford, uh, Better Start Bradford and Born in Bradford kind of research programs. Mm. I think they're incredibly important, but the really important thing is learning to speak each other's languages, building a shared infrastructure for research yeah, that we all understand and linking it to the process of policy development and innovation. And um, finally, I think you, you want it in terms of further areas of research. I've got three, which actually I think were all mentioned already. But I do think this thing about curric rapid curriculum innovation, I was struck by that statistic about how little teaching is being transformed by technology at the moment. When I know what's the figure, 60 percent of kids are now using chat GPT right? mm -hmm. for their, their studies. And um, actually, there's a there's a real need to look at the education system and how it how young people are learning and the skills that teachers have and also moving. You know, I remember my daughter did um, art at university and social media. She knew much more than any of the lecturers at her university, mm. which is good university. It's well rated for mm. the degree she did, but mm. just mm. they were educating the educators. So let's have, start to flip these things around, co-produce curriculum systems and get regulatory body. First thing. Second thing. Desperately need to look at managerial organizational culture in this country. Could not agree more. Mastering control, empowerment, democratization of the workplace. The tech is going to reduce the demand for managerialism. Let's make sure it empowers people within a kind of acceptable mm -hmm. framework. Mm -hmm. And the final thing, again, it was mentioned is flexibility in the employment contract. I mean, that four day week for productivity. Can you just the dramatic difference that would make for women in the workplace? Well, women and men, but can I just say it's usually women who still bear the cost of childcare? And it's a huge constraint, childcare sufficiency at the moment and the cost of sufficiency. But not just that, the contract that renegotiating the contract that might allow people to come in and out of uh, the workforce with an employer, but bringing new knowledge and skills and actually acknowledges the wider skills. Now, some of the big four, they just uh, brought PwC in as to have a growth hub in Bradford, as they do in Belfast. And they're working really hard at understanding these trends and implementing them. So those things. For me, there's also something which is little talked about, about the informal economy. It's huge in some of our big cities. Um, and we don't understand it. We don't understand how cash is being, you know, how wealth is being created and distributed. But when you have huge amounts of cash brought into the banking system, you need to, it would be good to understand the skills mix of, what's going on in that economy and how we might capture some of that entrepreneurialism. Um, Thank you. I can say more, but I'd leave it there. Thank you very much, Kirsten. And Richard from Birmingham. Thank you very much. I mean, I suppose I'd just make, make three points, uh, each fairly briefly. So I'm, I'm the director responsible for strategy uh, yep. at Birmingham, but I'm also responsible for a whole load of other things, as, you, you know, as is the way in local government, uh, including our cost of living response, our digital and technology services and a whole load of our kind of corporate uh, enabling services. And, it, you know, I suppose it's worth just reflecting what, to, to people, you know, what it's like at the moment in the sector um, and what it's like being in a big local authority, which is in intervention and financial distress. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And the, I suppose the key thing to say is there is just a huge contrast at the moment between the opportunities of the city and the capacity okay, of yeah. the local authority to respond to them. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. you know, a couple of years ago when, mm. we, you know, we weren't facing quite the same challenges, there was just an enormous field of opportunity, I thought, mm. for us to make better use of data, better use of research, to engage mm. with our partners more effectively, mm. to tackle mm. some of the complex issues across the city. Mm. And a lot of those opportunities are still there, mm. but the capacity of the organisation to take those opportunities is now just hugely under pressure. And yep. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that it's the same across whole you know, chunks of our country at the moment, yep. you know, our, yep. our, our local authorities um, and, other, uh, and other, other parts of governments, actually. And that is just, that, that feels awful. Yeah. You know, that feels it's really the same, awful. Richard, it's the same thing with the University for the Education Colleges as well. They're very pressed, again, for the, for the reasons that Kirsten said. But anyway, do go on. Yeah. So, so you've got a so there's a city, and yep. I'm sure, you know, you know, Bradford and lots of other cities are in the same situation where you've got these kind of, hotspots of opportunity mm. um, where you can see what needs to be done mm. actually to take advantage, to create innovation, to create mm. jobs and jobs and wealth. And and the but the <laughs> public authorities <laughs> are just hugely constrained from yeah, being yeah. able to, you know, it's to, a very to play important point. So um I guess two sorry, two slightly more positive things. <laughs> <laughs> um, one is the kind of research that we've been discussing today, I think is phenomenally important. And people mustn't think that just because there are these kind of tectonic plates of finance and intervention sort of moving, it's not important. I think it's phenomenally important. Things like the, you know, the Resolution Foundation uh, report that we were talking about earlier, which Birmingham participated in, really important and, and important at lots of different levels. And I suppose lots of people here will concentrate on the kind of technical, the data, the insight. But I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that actually the kind of top level messaging that is important for politicians and mm. public discourse is equally important mm. so it's really easy Good. in local political environments yeah. for the debate to be about how important you know yeah. the suburbs are and the less sort of well-served areas of the city as well as the city center and although manufacturing is you know, of course important mm. it's really easy to be nostalgic especially in a place like birmingham or you know other yes. places where you've got incredibly yeah, strong yeah. history yeah. whereas actually when you look at the really hot opportunities now they're in you know they're in a range of sectors and and uh, and certainly you know high tech manufacturing is not the main it's not actually the main opportunity yeah. for for us in birmingham and so just getting across some of that messaging, you've got to invest in your city centre, you've got to lean into your strength. It's a wonderful city centre, slightly... actually. I mean, I think the work that the city did in transforming the city is fabulous, right? I mean, it is a wonderful yeah. place. To... It's, a, yeah. it's a fab city yeah. to, you yeah. know, to, and that's why we've got loads of people relocating business to us. And you've got, you know, Arab and PwC and mm. HSBC, Goldman Sachs moving into the city. Mm. It's crazy, mm. you know. But it's only, but that's the city centre, and it's a 1.2 yeah, yeah, million understood. present city. So, yep, yep. so then, and then the, the just so research really important, and the multi levels of its impact. I just wanted to draw attention to. Yep. And then thirdly, the, the the importance of supporting the kind of local data and innovation um, ecosystem. Yeah. So, so we've set up a Birmingham City Observatory in the past couple of years, and. Some of the innovation that that is helping to drive is not so is partly there's a sort of research side of it, mm -hmm. but there's also things like, you know, by by creating the capability to mm -hmm. use census data at the local level effectively and to make it available mm -hmm. to people, mm -hmm. we're allowing, for example, our our um, our local colleges, further education colleges, to predict the nature of local demand. Yeah. Actually, sorry, lo local supply of it's demand in a certain sense but local supply of young people from different areas of the city of different ethnicities mm. with different socioeconomic backgrounds wow. and then to plan outreach courses that meet them in an incredibly granular level down to output area level wonderful and, and that kind of ecosystem i think is still one that um you know that local authorities can support and that the people in, in this um you know in this uh, workshop and uh, and seminar I, I'm encouraged to, to reach out to, but just looking back to my first point and then finishing, just conscious that at the moment, the yeah. capacity to respond Understood. is yeah, that's right. difficult. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. But no, very important point. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Daniel, back to Doncaster now. 
Hi, Keith. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, just by way of intro for colleagues on the call, I'm Dan Fell. I'm the Chief Executive of Doncaster Chamber of Commerce, an organisation that supports and represents uh, the business community. I'm privileged to do a range of other non-exec and voluntary roles linked to economic development in South Yorkshire, which in recent years has included chairing a successful project to open a university technical college in Doncaster, mm-hmm. which has been a, a runaway success, actually. Yeah, just, yeah evidence is the need for diversity and choice in our education system yeah. and another role i've been very privileged to do for five years um, is chair of cast theater in doncaster and uh, i'm so really passionate about the role of arts in education and perhaps that might come up in the conversation a little bit later on however i think the reason i'm here is because doncaster chamber leads on something called local skills improvement plans in south yorkshire local skills improvement plans the essential hypothesis and and not dissimilar to what Jürgen was describing in um, Austria earlier, is to, to put skills planning a bit closer to the private sector by moving it to bodies like us, employer representation entities. I'll confess I'm slightly agnostic about the policy. I'm not sure that we're any better or worse people who've gone before us at holding the, the pen on, on sort of offering those plans. But what I do think we've been able to be is two or three things that are quite critical. Firstly, we've been good compilers of evidence for our public sector partners in South Yorkshire, and we've got elegant partnerships where we can sort of dock that in well to organisations like our Mail Combined Authority, the FE sector, higher education institutions. I think we've to tilt in some sort of thought leadership and some good, innovative ideas from industry and the private sector about how we might create a stable skills system that has got the agility and dynamism in it that sort of employers um, covet. And I think we've also been as players sort of a really good convening role to get our system aligned and working well. And it feels like we're actually achieving that in South Yorkshire at the moment. Um, that else it produced a raft of recommendations of all these reports do. Four things I just want to highlight as sort of themes from that. Two to sort of make us sort of put our head in our hands. Two to give us actual reasons for sort of optimism <laughs> and that. Uh, the ones that sort of worry me a little bit more are, I, I should be careful I say this, bearing in mind the community of interest I represent, but we, you know, we measured on digital skills and there's a real lack of imagination about how employers were responding to that in terms of sort of game changing technology and the opportunities there. And I'm afraid I had far too many survey responses back telling me about kind of basic IT skills and so forth, which was a bit sort of a um, bit worrying. Uh, and it also highlighted a lack of attention that we play to middle management in our skills systems. We talk quite a lot about leadership. We talk quite a lot about entry level jobs, but there's a, a fundamental point that people leave bad managers more often than they leave bad organizations. So there the are two things I think sort of worry me a little. More reasons to be cheerful, two things. Actually, I got a real sense that we talk down our skill system far too much. We're a bit deficit based in this conversation. There's a lot of good things going on that employers are responding well to. Um, and also, I was really heartened by how sort of liberally and laterally employers are thinking about where talent came from in our communities in a really meritocratic way. The challenge is often just that last mile support that connects kind of hidden talent to hidden careers in our system. Conscious of time, so just my sort of final points. We've got loads of exciting growth sectors in South Yorkshire, you know, advanced manufacturing, which you will know well, Keith, you know, um, green mobility and so forth. But we also have risks that sort of logistics, warehousing stuff you talked about in a place like Doncaster means we've got double the national average of jobs at risk of automation. So that's a huge thing we have to wrestle with here. One thing I don't think has yet come out in our conversations today is just the micro and SME nature of our economy. 90 percent plus of our businesses employ 10 or fewer people. So whilst I'm relatively optimistic for the future, if we get our head round proper industrial strategy, maximise kind of skills devolution opportunities, we have an uptick in employer investment, that will only work if we think deeply about real wielding our policies and plans in the context of a micro and SME economy. Mm. Well, thank you very much. We've gone around. I'm going to pick up on a couple of the points being made, and then we'll go to some questions from outside. I mean, first thing we come back to, I think, is the idea of uh, we talk about skills, but actually, I think the bit that Chris Pissarati was talking about is the culture in terms of how training goes on. And, and you know, I've been um, talking about that since my father again talked about it when he talked about investment in skills at middle management level. 
And, and I do think that's right. That is a very, very powerful issue throughout British culture, in fact. But what it comes back to, I think, in some ways, is, is what you were saying, Daniel, about how you have the diverse set of training that's needed. We do have a kind of sort of monolithic uh, higher education system that's tuned to particular needs, you know, particular conceptions of what middle class parents want, in a sense, things of that sort. Whereas the adaptive needs, which local communities can have local business communities, are very much lacking. Now, what I've seen in, personally, in local authorities, comes back to what Richard said, is a lot of interest and understanding. <laughs> but I think that if you're going to do that, you do need much more substantial devolution and much more money associated with devolution as well. <laughs> so if you look at the, you know, the local partnership deal that went to South Yorkshire, for example, very welcome. But in my mind, it's still tiny compared to what the needs would be and what, say, Daniel people will spend. I don't know if people want to comment. So I think, actually, if you're going to have adaption to the local needs, to industry and things like that, you're going to need more money in terms of local voices. I don't know if you would agree with that, Jürgen, being running the Northern Powerhouse. <laughs> no, I mean, look, you, 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 you're absolutely right. So, I mean, I was really struck by what Richard said about you know, there's so much more opportunity than there is capacity to, mm. to deliver. Mm. And actually part of the capacity is to help, especially those micro businesses yeah. um, that Daniel um, was talking about. And when I led the Made Smarter review that you referred to yeah. earlier, which was all about looking at, you know, why is it that, especially those sorts of small to medium sized micro businesses, why are they not investing more and getting themselves ready more for digital IT? And therefore, why are they not investing in the skills of their people? Um, a lot of it did come down to leadership, management, um, I suppose it's sort of vision, you know, a lot of people were just, you know, they're sort of so in the busy mode of getting their output out, doing what they're doing. They're not thinking ahead, but actually you can put mechanisms in place that support those businesses. And indeed Made Smarter was one of those policies where there is a leadership program, a mentoring program, you know, people get sort of easy, ready-made technology packages that they can apply yeah, right. uh, in their organizations and you know, and the problem is, is as exactly as Richard said, there is not the capacity to, to really roll those out and deliver those and help them. And maybe just, if I just one final comment on that capacity. You know, I took a group of civil servants and local authorities to Leipzig in Germany. It was a long time ago now, about 10 years ago when I was still at Siemens, because I wanted to show them how some of what we're talking about works in Leipzig. And then they were talking about all these things they're doing, how they're helping their SME micro businesses. And then one of the British people said, but, you know, how do you get the money for all of these? And when you do bids and you, you know, you need to, and you, you get rejected. And at the other end, these people were just looking blank. Mm -hmm. They were saying, they were saying, what do you mean bids? You know, so no, I mean, we always struggle to spend the money we get allocated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and there was just, there was just a completely mm -hmm. different, you know, this recognition that you do have to put money particularly into the devolved regions yeah. so that they can help their uh, their economies grow and, and we and we're doing exactly the opposite right if you're going to i'm going to follow on with that if you don't mind because i i do think this devolution issue is critical in terms of local capability because kirsten you man mentioned uh, scotland and so i'm quite involved actually with the manufacturing capability in glasgow and their particular growth has been in photonics so actually the growth of the laser industry optics uh, whether it's used for imaging or actually communications. In fact, the lasers in Glasgow, but in Glasgow, do the machining of the phones you've probably got. They actually then, the machines are taken to, to, to China and actually machine a lot of the frames for, for iPhones. So I'm just saying it's possible there in Glasgow, as they've done with the Scottish government, to drive a very, very large, new, exciting new sector of technology. And I just say, what things you've seen in Brad, for example, in terms of your opportunities? And devolution that's what i was thinking yeah no absolutely i mean i want to say one thing which is i'm very aware that the messages from laborers is very little room for maneuver the fiscal mm. situation is very so i think it's really important to keep emphasizing the fact that there is much needed fiscal reform to give stability to the local systems where they're combined yeah, authorities right. or local authorities. so it goes back that, to richard again we're, isn't we're it for, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're four years past the fair funding review, the business yeah. rates reset, which actually properly values the value that businesses you know, are creating and therefore can contribute. Mm. Um, even 
a penny of national insurance coming to local systems to invest in infrastructure training would mm. make a huge difference. Yes. So it's a combination of reform, redistribution, and avoiding, as Jorgen says, abortive costs of bidding for, mm. you know, I think we spent 300 grand bidding for the levelling up fund only to be told <laughs> we were ineligible because we've got money in the first round. It's it's ridiculous, that sort of situation. Yeah. So there are absolute clusters. Um, again, uh, Bradford has a higher than the national average um, the amount of manufacturing, its history, but I don't want to be nostalgic about this. What we've got is emerging strength in electronics engineering, aerospace, RF, radio frequency clusters, actually, you know, and the mm. aerospace related, which is going to be incredibly important in the kind of geopolitical situation, yeah, cyber security and so on. So proper devolution, not decentralization to yes. West Yorkshire would enable proper sustained investment in that. We just need yeah. kind of consistent direction of travel, long-term funding agreements, accepting there's not masses of extra money, where the flexibilities can be given to be given to us, not earned autonomy. So, if you were to see some of the negotiations that go on around spending small amounts of money, you would be horrified. So, at the, this so Kirsten, business. follow up on that, because, I mean, if we believe, which I do actually, that in fact it is possible to spend very eff effectively in terms of future investment in local things. I mean, Richard's talked about the opportunities. What, what, what should researchers be doing to show the, the importance of that or actually effectiveness of that? What, what would be good? Richard, do you have a view on that? You've got a juicy project that we could show actually read, deliver stuff to the UK economy better. You know, just an example. You don't have to have it, but if you do, it'd be great. We'll yeah. nick it. I am. I have one example. It's not related to the economy. Richard, did you want to come in? You, you I mean, I'll just start. slightly clear comment, right? But we, uh, most of the people on this this call know what needs to be done. Yeah. The government and the treasury will not do it. Yeah. So we need to keep on banging away at you know some of the things that which embarrass people mm. into you know with a barrage of evidence and argument and yeah. you know clever articulation. To sell those work. What they need to do. Yeah. It's, it, I, I, I'd be tied up in negotiations over bootling aspects of funding. Yeah. When yeah. we've got, you okay. know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of funding streams coming into one organization. Yeah. Every yeah. one of them has got. That's a very important it's point. A, Daniel, do you want to come back on that? Sorry, sorry, Kirsten. Daniel? That's all right. It's fine. No, I mean, I, I can only concur with colleagues about the ridiculous abortive effort that goes into these competitive bids where often we're pitting our economies against each other for resource, which is ridiculous. But it's not just the abortive effort that's the problem. It's the inability to then know what tools you've got in your kit so you can act strategically as a place, you know, when you've got tiny little piecemeal bits of resource coming in. Yeah. So that's one issue. The other show I'd highlight is there's a lack of consistency from the centre in terms of its response to devolution. So on the topic of the skills and people that we're talking about today, I remember when South Yorkshire put its original devolution bid in and now hands up South Yorkshire made a bit of a cock up of that because we then started to snatch a bit of uh, defeat and draws a victory by fighting amongst ourselves for a few years. But that's still not the point I'm making today. Mm. The, the, the point is that we sort of put skills asks in. We understood our end-to-end -end skills system really well locally. Mm. And we put asks in to departments that then were were, were, were biz, you know, business and industrial strategy, department work and pensions and, and, and BFE. And we got, as a region, three very different responses back from mm. the centre. You know, we got mm. pretty much everything we asked for from biz. A few crumbs off the table from DWP and an absolute drawbridge up from DFE on this. <laughs> so if we're going to do sort of skills devolution, yeah. we've got to do a proper job. Yeah. But it's incumbent on us as places not just to moan at government about that. Yeah, when we okay. do get those opportunities, mm. we have to do them well and we have to have a greater appetite for risk and more trust in ourselves than I think we do currently. So I think there's, we've got to look Important. in the mirror about what we can do better ourselves, not yeah. just moan and groan at the centre. Good. Thank you. So we're going to move over then, Emily, back to the, uh, to the Thanks. outside world. Well, Thanks thank you very, very much, much people, Keith. And thank you to the panel. You've stimulated a lot of um, questions and thoughts from, from all the participants. So thank you. And I've only got time to touch on a few of them, but um, a lot of them have been around devolution, as you would expect. Um, I'd like to take a, um, one that's got a slightly different angle. Um, it was mentioned about the decline in the number of um, apprenticeships, particularly for young people over recent years since the levy. But I know at the same time that there are examples of, um, uh, of really fantastic opportunities in some areas. I wondered if any of you had some examples that you could give from your own areas where employers are offering apprenticeships and they're providing that kind of ladder of opportunity and 
what might we learn from those um, across the across the country and UK as a whole? Anyone want to go on that? Kirsten? Well, I'm happy to come in if no, <laughs> yeah. no one else is. So I think one of the things that we've done is to step into the apprentice system, which is like the local authority and employers and the colleges. So, for example, taking the transactional overhead cost of managing apprentices, um, particularly if you've got small and medium enterprises, to Dan's point, the, the vast majority of companies in Bradford haven't got the kind of bandwidth to be able to manage the apprenticeship system effectively. So if you actually, we have a skills house, which is working both with young people entering the labour market and those first from the labour market and trying to tailor and adapt. Um, also for certain sectors like the cultural sector, almost impossible um, to actually have proper apprenticeships, but negotiating with colleges around development of curriculum, things that can be accredited. We've done quite a lot of that. And we've backed that up with, we haven't gone down the route of uh, UTCs, but we have industrial centres of excellence led by employers against each of the growing sectors of the economy, which are 14 to 19 experiences of the world of work, working with schools, young people and the employer that then leads into a curriculum pathway and often into apprenticeships. And, and also maxing out and graduate apprenticeships is has been really important because that kind of continuous development of the workforce, as we've said, has been... Um, the focus on that's been diminishing. I mean, I look back to the days of investors and people almost with a rosy glow and it wasn't perfect as a system, but how many people really pursue anything of that nature anymore? So a few thoughts there. Just Can I Richard? make a quick, a quick policy point here, which is, so there is a policy problem that we can solve tomorrow about apprenticeships, which is that the apprenticeship levy, if it's underspent, gets clawed back by the Treasury. <laughs> and you've got loads of organisations, including loads of public sector organisations that underspend their apprenticeship levy. That's right. Treasury has, who cares, right? They love getting the money back. <laughs> we could ring fence that money to local apprenticeships provision. Yeah. Yeah. Other, other, yeah, other organisations. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Richard, I spoke earlier no. there. But just to, I mean, just may, given I raised this point, just very quickly, you know, I mean, there are lots of local good examples going on, you know, and Kirsten mentioned, you know, one of your colleges, you mentioned UTCs, I can talk in Greater Manchester, what some of the um, further education colleges are doing here. So there is local excellence. excellence. The problem is that's also our problem, <laughs> because in the lack of a national framework, yeah. everybody sort of makes it up locally. Yeah. And, uh, and what we need is we need a national framework that employers can understand and then leave the local um, you know, devolved powers to implement with excellence rather than coming up with lots of different structures and different frameworks. So, uh, you know, so it, it is, you know, we need we need that national framework and then leave it to locals to actually deliver it. I agree. And then I think my last <clears throat> my last question to you, slightly provocative, perhaps, is where would you where would you land in terms of do we need uh, some different system structurally in national government? Like, do we need a Ministry of Work as a question put forward from Andrew Webster, or is it more about um, how how you operate at local level and how how do devolution is organised? Happy to come in on this. I am. Um... I'm quite ambivalent about what we sort of call the various ministries or how we organise ourselves. I think that's not, you know, it's important, but it's not the crux of the issue. However we organise ourselves, though, we must leave things alone. Like we have absolute <laughs> initiative itis in this country, yeah, and yeah, yeah. particularly on skills yep. policy, you know, yep. get it right and then don't touch it for 10 years. That's the key thing with this because it is so hard to sort of constantly reconfigure and the short termism is absolutely crippling the economy. So don't mind what you call it, but get it right and don't <laughs> touch it for a decade. Yeah, yeah. Hey, well, shall I wrap up? Yes, I can, think we will wrap up Can now. I just come in quickly on? on, on yeah, yeah, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, sure. So I, I, think it is, I think it is less about structures and more about incentives. Where are the incentives mm -hmm. for the major institutions to prioritise these sorts of issues? DWP doesn't have them. Local authorities have very weak incentives in this area, very weak, virtually no statutory duties. You know, colleges, yeah. of course, have their own incentives. Providers have their own their own incentives, but they are they are very particular. It's I think true. there's a critical lack of incentives in this area. Yeah, when when at Sheffield we set up Sheffield University, we set up an apprentice 
Training Center with AMRC. I was asked by Tim Melville Ross, the head of Hefke, why did you set this up? You had no advantage. There was no incentive to do it. I said, well, maybe it was the right thing to do. <laughs> and I think that's actually the other thing we have to think. Do we understand what the right thing to do? Are we then, do we have the discretion to do them? That's what you said. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll just say a very few words um, to close our session today. Um, really thank you to all of our speakers and contributors. We are hugely grateful for all of your input and you give us given us a huge amount to think about. We've, um, we, we've covered so much today, so I know that I for sure will need some time to digest, digest all of that. Um, as, as Tim mentioned and Keith mentioned, this is a, such a crucial area for us as we, as we look ahead to our strategy development. And we really see today as the start of a conversation about where better data and evidence can improve opportunity, um, and also where the Nuffield Foundation, where we should be putting our focus so thank you very much for your contributions. We will leave the Slido open until the end of tomorrow. So that will be there in case you have any further thoughts and want to um, add to that. And do share thoughts with us directly um, if you would like to do so. So we hope you've enjoyed today. Um, we certainly have. And thanks, thanks again very much for joining us.